So we're going to start today and go through the dreamer of the dream section. Suffering is an emphasis upon all that the world has done to injure you. Here is the world's demented version of salvation clearly shown. Like to a dream of punishment in which the dreamer is unconscious of what brought on the attack against himself. He sees himself attacked unjustly and by something not himself. I think that sentence really gets at the two central ideas. Attacked unjustly. So that's the old thing of it's not fair. And by something not himself. That's where the subject-object split comes in. That something not himself could be another person other than himself, which he identifies as a person. It could be a dog. You could, someone could feel themselves perceive, perceive themselves as attacked by a hurricane or a tornado. But it, it is something that is not himself. There's, you can tell beneath all of those things, which seem to be quite varied in form, there's still the subject got to split. There's something that is doing the attacking and there's something that's being attacked. And again, if, if we took that in a little deeper, it would be the body identification or the pers personhood, which is the, the subject. Person versus something. Or it could be the strange variation, which is summarized maybe by the statement, I keep beating myself up over this. <laughs> Where it's the body and the, the person that seems to do things to themselves, but this is, the, this is not the, the real self, of course. It's just an image. They talk about self-inflicted wounds or drawing pain to myself, attracting, you know, pain in some form and this and that, and that's all still... self hate. Yeah. It's still broken up as if this, the self is, is an image in linear time. And somehow as if you can, you can think of times when you've done things to harm yourself or whatever, or even seem to be doing something it would seem that somebody who had a, a knife who inflicted a wound on the arm, that would seem to be a self-inflicted wound. But that still isn't self. That's the image. <laughs> That's the past. That's just another image, just like an image of, of an intruder coming into a house, so to speak, and coming in and inflicting a wound. It would seem to be different than a self inflicted wound, but in both cases, bodies can seem to harm other bodies, and bodies can even seem to harm themselves, but all of them are projections, all of them are images, in that sense. So are you saying that it's always the case of, there's always a person involved, and there's always this something else, and they're all in and the conflict seems to be between the person and something else. But I'm trying to translate this over to when you project onto the person that you identify with. And, and then it's the person you identify with against or in conflict with what? So the person you identify becomes the object, the subject and the object, I think is what you're saying. It's like you can even make what seems to be one thing, both the subject and the object. Yeah. Oh, okay. When you say self-inflicted wound, it's as if one is actually inflicting harm or injury or attacking oneself. And the basic premise of the Course is that mind cannot attack. Good! Hallelujah! Thank heaven! That's why mind is innocent because mind cannot attack. The wrong mind, you know, is part of this construction where it's, it's identified, the mind believes it's, it has left its 
is abstract reality and it's taken on form and and bodies can can seem to attack. So the illusion of attack seems to occur in form. And there is a sense of that. I mean, even in expressions when we say, oh, I'm warring with myself or I'm fighting against myself or, you know, commonly how notions that we have of this, that, that there's almost like two parts of me that are in conflict. Yeah, in conflict. Even the expression, part of me where it knows, or part of me feels, or part of me whatever is it. Yeah, parts, you know, that that aren't always congruent or something. Or that don't that don't agree. Yeah. And that way, that whether it's self-inflicted wound in terms of physical, or I'm having a war in my mind right now, or whatever, all of them are the statements of the wrong mind. What mind is warring with itself? And it seems it's very careful when you even get into warring and talk about different parts. It's again that the right mind and the wrong mind are not at war. No. The wrong. The right mind doesn't fight. Right. The right mind does not respond. Mm -hmm. The wrong mind, you could say, attacks, or even better, is just a belief system of attack. Not like it's an entity. <laughs> but it's just a. Projects the path out, but yeah. there's nothing to receive it. Yeah. So it's it's the illusion of attack. Mm -hmm. And. The images that are always seeming to be at war, the different parts, are always different segments and aspects of, of an illusion. In other words, when someone says, for example, well, I've, I'm going to, like a runner, I'm going to try, I'm not really competing against other runners, but I'm competing with myself, then it's really just two images. I mean, it's like the mind holding uh, maybe like an ideal time for running the mile or whatever. That maybe, or maybe it's some time that has run in the past. Right. So it's a past image of a time that has run, and now it believes that it's a separate image from that now, and it's going to try to run and beat that time. So we're always talking about whenever we're talking about competition with oneself or attacking oneself or whatever. There, there are images that are involved. So what's the image, what are the images involved in someone who inflicts the wound on himself? They seem to be the one doing it and the one receiving it. The one attacking and the one being attacked. The arm, kind of like you could say, is holding the knife. Yeah. And the arm but is it's getting it. What, it. what I hear you saying, too, is it's just a demonstration of the duality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is the wrong mind. It doesn't take two of anything to demonstrate duality, not two bodies or not two not an attacker and a person being attacked or a victim and a victimizer. Yeah. It's the duality in the mind. Yeah. Not the physical duality of a subject and an object, even. Yeah, it's projected out that way. Even if you said yeah, a self-inflicted wound, there would be the kind of the hand that was holding the knife and, and the arm, arm that was getting the wound. You know, there's still you can still see the duality right. perceived in the world. Yeah. Even in that example, yeah, it's, you could say, well, it's just one person, one body. Well, wait a minute, <laughs> one holding the knife and one receiving the blow, right so to speak. Yeah. See, it's not, when you were saying it's in the mind, the whole key is to the see mind is it doesn't want to see that it's, it's just holding on to a false belief system. So it projects the split yeah. out of the world and it does the duality. You could just say plain duality. That, that is cleaving what is one into parts. That's where all the extremes come in that we've talked about. Hot, cold, fast, slow, male, female. High, low, on and on and on, all the seeming extremes. Right arm, left arm. Right arm with knife. <laughs> left arm without knife. You know, I mean, you can break it up any way you want. 
but the whole key is to start to see that there isn't any duality in the world. The world's just the screen. It comes back to our um, our borderland discussion, where the key thing is to learn what what is the same and what is different. What is the same? All the images. Everything on the screen is the same. What is different? The right mind and the wrong mind. Two different purposes in mind. They are different. <laughs> they are not alike at all. You know, one's a reflection of reality, the other one's non-existent. <laughs> that's different. <laughs> They're different in every way. So that's what we keep coming back to all the time. It's just a clear, clear understanding of what is the same and what is different. You can tell that all of the seeming upsets that have come up over the last several weeks or years and whatever have always have always been an ambiguity about that distinction. You have to believe that specifics are different for them to be important whether there's this kind of cookies, number of cookies in a jar or not, whether the rug is this clean or not, whether, you know, it means to go on and on and on. All the seeming difficulties that come up have the underlying assumption that there are aspects of this world that are different from other aspects. And consequently, some can be better than others. Right. Some can be better than others. And, yeah, and causation, you know. As simple as the little thing you were just sharing about the pamphlet that the the newsletter, so to speak, or whatever you call it, could excerpts from the dialogue could whet the appetite for the pamphlet. You know, and you can see the causation, even in subtle ways, is in there. And the the whole point of of all of this is to come to the awareness that images are images are images, illusions are one. That there isn't any causation in the world. Mm. Talk about rest. What, what, would you, what would you need to do? You know? and, and what conflict could you feel if you realized there wasn't duality in the world? There wasn't hierarchies of images. Miracles would be universal. Miracles would be, there would be no order of difficulty in miracles. You would have on your hands the last miracle and the first, <laughs> the atonement. <laughs> you know, the whole discussion of miracles is kind of like taking this idea of the atonement and, and as if it's strung out, the mind believes in linear time, as if it was a string like beads on a string, as if the first bead was the same as the last bead, and that all the beads in between were somehow helping collapse the string, so that the first bead and the last bead could come together and be seen as one and the same. The first miracle and the last miracle was and is the atonement. And the only reason that this is a course in miracles and it's being described in terms of becoming more miracle-minded and thinking habitually miracle-minded and right-minded and this and that is because the mind believes in linear time. So that's a metaphor. The miracle is a metaphor of all those beads in between. Holy encounters, it's the same way. You know, it seems as if it's described as if um, when Whenever you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. Well, do you see the body components that are described in that metaphor? Meeting anyone, as you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. When we're going to be traveling to some of these places out west, you'll start to see that they're starting to come to the idea that, that there's only one miracle, that's the atonement. There's only one holy encounter. There's only one holy instant, you know, it's, it's, it's transcending the metaphor and coming to that state of mind that, that sees all of that was just like stepping stones. There's only one holy relationship. It's not described that way 
and of course the miracles a lot of times.